Today, we have another very topical program. I think it's amazing how well our program committee does in getting uh, speakers to come really when the topic is of the most uh, vitality and most concern to the community, and they have certainly done so today. The Metropolitan Arts Commission began as a city beautification advisory committee in 1954 as an advisory committee to the city council. And for nearly 20 years, its members were involved in such projects as the institution of the Street Tree Program, the design of county bridges, and the effort to renovate the Civic Auditorium. In 1973, the Arts Commission assumed its present form as a city-county agency with a 15-member appointed commission. It is an independent city bureau under the leadership of Commissioner Mildred Schwab. The charge to the Metropolitan Arts Commission is to provide public funding in support of the arts. Its current budget is $900,000, 60% of which comes from the city, 40% from the county, although some of that comes indirectly from the federal government. It is spent primarily on grants, and the funds are allocated through a panel process to major arts institutions and what are called mid-sized arts organizations, as well as to special projects for seniors, and multicultural populations. The Arts Commission is also in charge of the public art collection for the city and county, and its commissioning of Portlandia is no doubt the most well-known example of the Percent for Art program, which makes so much of our community's public art possible. In its role as an advocate for the arts in the city and county, the Arts Commission is involved in the Central City Plan, in publishing an economic impact of the arts, and in representing the arts in public forums. Our speaker today is Dorothy Passantini. She is a native of Oregon, a graduate of the University of Oregon School of Journalism. She's a calligrapher. She's involved in real estate development in Sun River. But she's here today, of course, in her capacity as a member of the Metropolitan Arts Commission on which she has served for the past four years. She was chair of the Grants Review Committee before becoming chair of the commission itself in 1984, and she is now completing her second term as chair of the commission. Please welcome Dorothy Passantini. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. The City Club has always been a leader in attempting to balance all the needs of the Portland community. Your continued interest in the arts increases the City's awareness of Portland's artistic endeavors, and your concern provides a strong push toward achieving a balanced cultural environment. Before I really begin today, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of the Metropolitan Arts Commission, Selena Autumn. Selena, can you stand up just a second, right down here in front? Thank you. In addition to her Portland duties, Selena has been president of the National Assembly of Local Arts Agencies for the past two years. She has been a relentless worker on behalf of the arts in Portland since she assumed her current position in 1980. Lewis Mumford once said that the artist has a special task and duty, the task of reminding men of their humanity and the promise of their creativity. As members of the Arts Commission, we view our role as one that reminds the community of the arts so that the artists, in turn, can remind us of all that we might become. We have been asked here today because the arts are much in the news recently, and mostly for less than positive reasons. Our symphony faces a major funding crisis, a fact that has made the headlines in the Oregonian. In addition, we have read about the problems of financing the Performing Arts Center, the deficit facing the Civic Theater, the closures and near closures of other organizations about which I will say more later. Taken in aggregate, these problems should point out some important issues to the residents of this region. This series of news items indicates more than isolated failures of management or of faith. The trend indicates that we may somehow be lacking either awareness of or commitment to the needs of a growing arts community. Perhaps then this is a good time for us to truly examine our relationship to the arts, to look at our community's perception of itself, its goals and future expectations. 
then we might want to reevaluate our public and private commitment to arts projects and begin to put the arts in the context of other community needs. At this point, I want to say that all the commission members are acutely aware of the tremendous pressures on our public funds and on individuals and corporate contributors for a myriad of social service needs. However, commission members feel strongly that arts education, promotion, and creation are also essential to the improvement of the human condition. Americans have long maintained a commitment to the teaching of the humanities in our public schools. And I think we would shudder at the thought of schools that teach only practical courses, technical and business skills and theory, to the exclusion of literary literature and philosophy. In the same context, therefore, it seems inconsistent that we could consider funding public services without including the literary, visual, and performing arts. Solomon Guggenheim, mining executive and noted arts patron, once said, all day long, I add up columns of figures and make everything balance. I come home, I sit down, I look at a Kandinsky, and it's wonderful. It doesn't mean anything. And of course, what he meant was that it doesn't have to mean anything. Guggenheim valued his artworks even though he couldn't do anything with them, and they didn't help him make any more money. In fact, he thought so much of the visual arts that he endowed one of New York's major art museums. Keep in mind that the Arts Commission's long-range goal is not just to maintain a viable artistic community for the people who have traditionally patronized the arts, but to make sure that the arts are truly accessible to everyone living here. We must keep in mind the goal of universal access to a full spectrum of cultural events so that the spiritual enrichment of the fine arts becomes integrated into each citizen's life. Now, while we're talking about the benefits of the arts to the community and a rationale for public support, we can certainly talk about the multitude of economic benefits that public funding of the arts brings to Portland. For example, every dollar of public money distributed through the Arts Commission leverages 14 additional dollars for nonprofits organizations, nonprofit arts organizations. Of that money, more than 50% pays for salaries. The rest is returned to the community for lumber, canvas, costumes, printing, and day-to-day -day supplies. An Arts Commission economic impact study estimates a multiplier effect of nearly $3 for every dollar spent by an arts organization. This indicates the spin-off economic benefit to the community from contributions to the arts. These figures don't include the money spent on parking or public transportation, babysitters, dinners, and other associated costs of an evening out. The study estimates that $4 million in paid admissions to arts events in Portland in one year generated an additional $11 million in associated spending. In terms of encouraging economic development in Portland, we will use only one example. Had it not been for the Performing Arts Center, the Heathman would not have been restored. The city would not have benefited from the activities of a private restoration effort, a profitable employer in downtown, and a wonderful addition to our city. A significant art community can put a city on the map. Look at Ashland. In fact, closer to home, look at what the Mount Hood Jazz Festival has meant to the community of Gresham. We can recite dozens of similar examples nationally. Yet this economic argument should not overshadow the larger rationale that the arts are essential to the health and well-being of a society and deserve community support. In a few minutes, I will share with you the Metropolitan Arts Commission's agenda for the 1986-87 fiscal year. But before that, I'd like to discuss more clearly the financial condition of the arts here in Portland as well as we can define it. Many of you have read of the plight of the symphony, that in the process of becoming a full-time professional organization, the symphony has acquired a deficit of $900,000. The opera, as well, has a deficit of more than $700,000. Last year, the Oregon Contemporary Theater, Portland's only full equity theater company, closed its doors. Storefront Theater came close to shutting down permanently last winter. 
Many other organizations have been forced to make cutbacks that limit their artistic choices and their ability to expand. For example, area theater groups are taking fewer risks by sticking to shows with proven box office track records. The Portland Center for the Visual Arts has had to cut back its wonderful performance series. Finally, boards of directors are forced to make decisions based on short-term returns. And in many cases, management level salaries are too low to attract and support the talent and expertise worthy, worthy of these associations. We may well ask, what is happening that Portland in its public and private efforts is failing to provide adequate support to these organizations? Perhaps the single answer to this is that while the leadership of the arts organizations believe that the time is right to commit to excellence, the rest of this community has not made that commitment. For example, several years ago, music enthusiasts decided that Portland needed a full-time symphony, that only a professional musical organization could do justice to the people of this city and indeed to the new facility in which it would be performing. So the symphony grew. Its financial needs grew. Its expectations and certainly its quality grew. What did not grow accordingly, despite numerous fundraising efforts, was the funding capability. The Portland Civic Theater recognized that actors are a valuable commodity. To be able to practice their art, they must have some type of income, or they join one of the most talented pools of waiters and waitresses in the world, the underemployed artists of Portland. But again, this action, while bold and decisive, and most likely necessary to the continued operation of the Civic, was never matched by the community in terms of supplying adequate support. As members of the Arts Commission, we have been pleased to see the organizations themselves making commitments to professionalism, to excellence, and to an expanded vision that goes beyond the boundaries of Portland. It has been this city's experience that the most successful art endeavors are those that have looked at the national arena and attempted to involve Portland with national activities. It is critical to a growing community to be plugged into a national arts network. The symphony, the opera, and chamber music Northwest depend on performers, performers who bring with them excellent skills and the perspective and interpretation of other parts of the world. In turn, our artists gain exposure to other styles, other contacts, and new opportunities. Pacific Ballet Theater has brought to Portland internationally recognized dancers, a major accomplishment and a wonderful contribution to the city. The Mount Hood Jazz Festival is now rated by Rolling Stone Magazine as one of the top 10 jazz festivals in the country. Our community received this acknowledgement through the festival's commitment to excellence and willingness to reach out and bring in national stars of the highest caliber. Some recent examples are illustrations of what a national perspective can do for our community. They resulted in the kind of publicity that money could never buy and that could never be planned for, but is invaluable to our future. Portland Arts and Lectures has completed two successful seasons of bringing nationally known authors to speak here. This last season, writers Calvin Trillin and Tom Wolfe spoke in Portland, and both left with strong, positive impressions of our city. The result? A delightful tribute to Portland in The New Yorker and two full pages on Portlandia in Newsweek magazine. The Metropolitan Arts Commission has managed to leverage a tremendous amount of national attention. Between Portlandia and Ed Carpenter's window in the Justice Center, which graces the cover of the most recent journal of the American Institute of Architecture, this city is developing quite a strong reputation for fine public art. Next year, the National Assembly of Local Arts Agencies will hold its convention in Portland. The group chose Portland because of its commitment to public art and the many cultural amenities here. The question is then, do we have the intention and the wherewithal to follow through on the good start we have made? Can we take advantage of the talent and the energy here and the potential of an improved image nationally? I believe that it is the time we address directly the question of the arts here in Portland. And further, I believe it is time we make a commitment to the arts. 
and a commitment to the excellence based on the tremendous amount of ability, talent, and desire already in existence here. But this will take some real work. First of all, we have quite a way to go in committing public funds to the arts. The average yearly per capita amount of public funding for nonprofits or arts organizations in Multnomah County is $1.70. We might expect that we would compare poorly to Dallas, Texas with a per capita public expenditure of $4.95 or San Francisco with an average of $4.28 per person. Indeed, these are much larger communities with a much higher standard of living. But how can we explain the discrepancy between our $1.70 and and the city of Seattle's commitment of $4.03 per person in public money. A more shocking statistic is that of Oregon's state support to the arts. Oregon ranks 55 out of 56 states and territories in providing general fund dollars to the arts. I think Idaho is the only one lower than us. The legislature allocates 17 cents per capita to the arts. That's less than the cost of one postage stamp per person. Private support for the arts is not broad-based here. While Portland has relatively few head corporate headquarters compared to other cities and is still trying to recover economically, we still should be able to expect a great deal more support than is evidenced today. Several weeks ago, the Oregonians surprised many readers when it printed that only six individuals and eight corporations had contributed more than $10,000 to help the symphony. The Opera and the Oregon Art Association listed even fewer large corporate or individual contributors than the symphony. Only one recipient of Arts Commission funding, the Pacific Ballet Theater, recorded a single corporate or individual gift over $20,000. Consequently, we find ourselves with a limited ability to attract national potential in certain areas. For example, the Portland Art Museum at the Oregon Art Institute spends only $260,000 a year on exhibits. When you consider that the Seattle Museum spends about twice that yearly, and that OMSI paid $100,000 for seven weeks of the Muppets, you realize how few national exhibits our, our art museum can afford to bring in. Furthermore, in addition to their current economic crunch, our performing arts organizations can expect to see their costs rise significantly when they move to the larger stages and more sophisticated equipment in the Performing Arts Center. In Eugene, groups using the Holt Center experienced major cash shortfalls, even though the local groups paid reduced user fees. The total indebtedness of four major Holt Center users is now $800,000. And Portland has no comprehensive plan to support potential users of the Performing Arts Center. Leaders of the arts community have been bold in declaring that Portland must begin to see itself as a first-class community with a first-class set of arts organizations. As James DePriest, our symphony's artistic director, points out, we are at a crossroads. We must decide between an amateur standing in the arts world and professional top-rate quality. Do we choose to remain a part-time arts town? This is the question we must answer soon. Franklin Delano Roosevelt once said, every time an artist dies, part of the vision of mankind passes with him. What would that president say about the loss of value placed on the arts in a community like ours? It is now the time to rally behind the artistic vision of a better future, to make sure that our community is never in danger of losing the transcendent blessings of the arts. Several months ago here, you heard Bob Scanlon talk about identifying Oregon's strengths, giving it our all, and achieving excellence in the tourism area. He talked about narrowing our sights on a few goals and making sure that whatever we do, we do very well. Let's adopt Mr. Scanlon's ideas and energy, and let's focus on the excellence in the arts as one of our goals for Portland. We see this city's overwhelming potential as a cultural center, not only for Oregon, 
but for the Pacific Northwest. We certainly have the foundation. Now it's time to start building. Let's begin to see Portland as a destination city, not just a place that windsurfers pass through on their way to Hood River, nor as a quaint one-night stop on the way to Seattle. For as we develop the special qualities of this community for outsiders, we will also have them to savor for ourselves. Certainly, cities starting with far greater handicaps have excelled in promoting the arts as central to their city's identities. For example, who would ever have envisioned Baltimore as a cultural gem on the East Coast? But thanks to an eager community and a visionary mayor, Baltimore's inner harbor waterfront provides a showplace for contemporary folk and classical art. It is splendidly integrated with the commercial and recreational aspects of an emerging central city. Baltimore's inner harbor now serves as the gathering place for the annual city fair. The festival drew half a million people a day the first year in its new site. And the new location is cherished by the residents of Baltimore. Not incidentally, Harbor Place, a key ingredient in Baltimore's urban renewal, earned $3.2 million in city and state tax revenues in its first year. Charleston, South Carolina, on the basis of its architectural resemblance to a town in Italy, drew the attention of composer Giancarlo Minotti. Minotti chose Charleston to house the American version of his yearly world music festival in Spoleto, Italy. Previously, Charleston had depended on the military as its major source of payroll. By the festival's fourth year, this 17-day event brought in $100 million, one quarter of the military payroll for the entire year. I say if Baltimore can be so blessed, if Charleston can make it work, certainly the people of Portland can too. We have so much going for us now from the Oregon School of Arts and Crafts, the oldest craft school in the country, to an excellent symphony, to one of this country's strongest public art programs. Even the controversial Portland building guarantees Portland a place in discussions of architecture in America. So let's build on this solid base and consolidate our energy. Let's develop a collective vision joining public sector, private, political, and educational sectors into a widespread effort to bring excellence to the arts and bring the arts to Portland. Public and private forces join solidly behind the Performing Arts Center to create a tremendous attraction for Portland. We believe such an effort can be made again only on a broader and more pervasive scale. We believe there is a role for everyone in this undertaking. Certainly, the arts commissioners will take the lead when possible. But later, I will outline how I believe we can work together to accomplish our goals of, e of excellence. In our role as arts advocates and distributors of public funds for the arts, the Metropolitan Arts Commission has established a number of goals for the coming year. We believe these are a good basis for a community-wide commitment to the arts. Our first goal is to work with exi existing city bureaus to integrate an arts agenda into their regular activities. For example, the arts have never been included in the priorities of the Portland Development Commission, nor have they been used as a selling point for our community. We hope to work with the PDC to present information and ideas about the role of the arts in economic development and the potential for mutual assistance between development and the arts. The arts can make what has been a strong, successful development program even stronger. We have also targeted the Planning Bureau, the Design Review Commission, and the Bureau of Parks and Recreation as agencies which have an important role to play in arts development. The Metropolitan Arts Commission has approached Metro, the Port of Portland, and the Portland Public Schools to implement Percent for Art ordinances. These ordinances would require a percentage of these entities' capital construction budgets to be set aside for art, assuring that airport additions, schools, the zoo, and the convention center would have assured budgets for artwork. This year, excellence is the guideline for commission undertakings. We will once more be reviewing the grant amounts and number of grants awarded and reevaluating our panel process. 
and we have developed an excellence in the arts grant given to an arts institution that can demonstrate to us a visionary plan to increase artistic excellence. One of the Arts Commission's most pressing concerns is the identification of a dedicated funding source for the arts. Both the mayor and Commissioner Lindbergh have publicly expressed the need for an operating subsidy for the Performing Arts Center. The fiscal demands on the local users are also of a real concern. General fund revenues will not be adequate to support those demands. The Arts Commission has proposed a number of funding options for those, these special arts needs, and we are encouraged by the very preliminary discussions by the City Budget Office regarding the alternatives. Now these are the major activities that we have laid out for next year for the Arts Commission itself to work on. But the problem of a sustained and aggressive drive to support the arts must go beyond the issue of public funding, beyond the scope and budget of the Arts Commission, beyond the dedication of political leaders. The energy, enthusiasm, and the money must come as well from the private sector, from individuals and corporations. Furthermore, this commitment must be picked up by various sectors and institutions now operating within our city. Let's look at some possibilities that we feel are both practical and necessary. The Arts Commission hopes to work more closely with the Greater Portland Visitors and Convention Center, which can be an important ally and promoter of the arts. Our city's cultural health will have a great effect on GPCVA's ability to promote Portland as a convention site and tourist attraction. It is time, we believe, that this community's educational institutions become more strongly involved with arts education and advocacy. Our children are not receiving a solid education in the arts, which I believe is not only a terrible personal waste, but will ultimately affect this nation's ability to produce creative thinkers in all fields. To make significant changes in the schools will require a united message from individual educators, parents, taxpayers, and businesses willing to work with the schools to develop a more aggressive arts agenda. Another element in this collective vision is the City Club. Your commitment is evidenced to the arts as evidenced by the recent appointment of a standing committee on arts and culture. We strongly urge your further support of a, of a proposal to look into possibilities of funding for the arts. The stature and credibility of a City Club report on this issue would make a major impression on this community, its media, its policymakers, and its voters. Finally, let's look at how the private sector supports the arts today and how we can build on that critical support. As of 1984, corporations, individuals, and foundations represented 86% of all arts funding in Portland. Now, we can all name five or six or seven individuals and a handful of corporations who have contributed tremendous amounts of time, energy, and money to one or more arts causes. But this support could be much more extensive. A new entity, the Business Committee on the Arts, has been developed by corporate executives to direct and solidify corporate interest in the arts. We hope Portland's corporations will rally behind this new effort. In addition, we encourage corporations to draw on the tradition of contributing to the arts with an increased vision of their importance to this community. If OMSI was able to raise $90,000 in corporate contributions for a seven-week Muppet exhibit, we think that our corporate community should be able to muster similar enthusiasm for sustained support of a full range of performing literary and visual arts. And most arts organizations offer a number of ways for contributors to be recognized for their gifts through private receptions, special performances, and a variety of acknowledgments. We hope that more companies will begin to see arts contributions as a routine part of their marketing and public relations strategies. As individuals, many of us feel that we have satisfied our obligation to the arts by purchasing season tickets or attending a yearly fundraiser. But let's look at the issue of cost this way. While you pay $13 or so to attend a theater performance, the organization's costs are approximately double that 
for each person in attendance. This is true not only in Portland, but for every nonprofit arts organization in America. Each time you attend a concert, a play, or a ballet production, remember, your ticket has been subsidized by tax money and by the generosity of a few philanthropists dedicated to the arts. Paying the ticket price means that you are keeping a company from losing more money from empty seats, but it is a far cry from providing a positive influx of funds. There are many here today who can afford to make major contributions to the arts. I encourage you all to do so. I believe quite strongly that we are not contributing to our capacity. Each and every art organization needs the help now and they will continue to need this help in the future. Barry Johnson, the visual arts writer for the Oregonian, gave us a creative solution for helping the arts. He suggested that we can make a financial difference by getting together and encouraging each other to give. If each of us asked 10 or 15 of our friends to join us in our commitment to excellence, we might be able to raise that five or $6,000 collectively for a single arts organization. And that can make a huge difference to that organization. There will be those of you who say that now is not the time to make a commitment to the arts. You may say, wait until the time is right, when the economy is better. And we on the Metropolitan Arts Commission say there will never be a better time. Historically, the arts have flourished during the most desperate of times. Shakespeare, Dunn, Marlowe, and Spencer created during one of the most difficult economic periods in British history. The human spirit depends upon artistic energy to help it through its lowest points. The city of Seattle recognized the importance of the arts as an uplifting and dynamic force during the Boeing crisis in the mid-70s. The Seattle Arts Commission and the police department were the only city agencies to receive budget increases in 1975. And during the 30s, a time when America's economy was in shambles, the administration created federal arts projects under the Works Project Administration. With a primary goal of aiding jobless artists, the WPA projects ultimately helped our country, which was struggling spiritually as well as economically, to emerge from a severe depression. If we wait for a better time, we may wait forever. The opportunity is now, and we must use our vision, our energies, and our commitment to create the vital cultural environment we want and deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. If you want to ask questions, uh, please come to uh, one of the microphones and stay at the microphone until the uh, question has been answered. Our first question uh, will be presented by Mary Kramer, our board host for the day. Dorothy, you mentioned several cities who have done <clears throat> quite well, like Charleston, in support of the arts. And I understand Minneapolis is another city that has developed a great deal of home uh, support for their arts. What uh, secrets do they have that maybe we're missing? Or, or maybe another way to say that is, what can I go home and tell my neighbors and friends who say to me, well, I can't support the arts right now. We have too many other pressing problems. Well, there are always pressing problems, though, aren't there? And this is one of the pressing problems. Um, I don't know that they have any secret other than um, perhaps the dedication of a, of a few citizens who decide they want to make it happen. It just takes a few people to start getting together and saying, this is what we want. And before long, that snowballs and things take shape. How does anything get done? The same way. Pete Plumridge, City Club member and chairman of the Arts and Culture Standing Committee. I want to commend you, Mrs. Piazzantini, for a very eloquent and complete statement of the state of the arts. We would certainly concur with your conclusions. One element that you did neglect to mention, though, in your discussion of the arts climate in Portland was the for-profit 
type arts businesses around town. We have also been distressed by seeing the closure of the Fountain Gallery and by the bankruptcy of celebrity, celebrity attractions, two of the premier for-profit organizations in the city. And I'm wondering, what do you think the Metropolitan Arts Commission should be doing, if anything, to help the for-profits also survive in our, in our climate? I think that just making sure that Portland is a receptive climate to the arts is really what uh, would do the most good there. Um, keeping in mind that the, the arts are very important, and yes, they are worth spending your money on, and what all. I don't know that we can actually, we can't certainly bail them out or anything of that sort. That, that isn't possible for us to do. But uh, we think that the arts, no matter where they come from, are great, and we, we want to encourage uh, everyone in that respect. Uh, Kirk Wilson, member of the City Club Standing Committee on Human Services, and a board member of one of your fledgling art organizations that you support. Um, many of these art organizations could probably use the assistance of the Arts, arts Commission on approaching various businesses for sponsorships, co-sponsorships, um, and gifts, and so on. Have you ever considered um, the pros and cons of a, if you will, a united way for art? or an, a, a way for the Arts Commission to assist those organizations in obtaining funds, either through logistics or through advice or service or what have you. And secondly, uh, one of the other bigger budget items almost every small arts organization is publicity. Is there a way for the Arts Commission to work in a combined effort and a coalition of the various arts to publicize these and hopefully get better advertising rates and, and so a person has a single place to look for for their arts information? Uh, either mailers to the home or in the, in the newspaper? You've given me too much all at one time. Um, the, uh, I'll answer the last part first. The, uh, the Arts Commission does um, uh, provide a mailer which lists arts activities in the area. We also have programs of technical assistance and that does include some grant writing expertise which is passed on. That's primarily for our grants, but in fact it would certainly help um, organizations who want to approach other granting organizations too. So we do that. Um, the We don't think that we want to go out ourselves and raise money, particularly for the arts. Now that may sound strange, but we have considered it, and the reason we don't want to do it is because we feel it would add one more layer to the bureaucracy that you already have to go through. In other words, we would be competing with the very organizations that we support. So we think it's more appropriate for each individual arts organization to do it for themselves. Um, but we do have some technical assistance, and I think that probably could be expanded. Um, the United Way for Art. This one kind of reminds me of the, the old joke about the, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> and, the thing here is that each organization that joins that United Way for Arts has to want to make that happen. Um, it can't be something that's foisted off on arts organizations. Um, the, good, the good part of it is, there, there are pros and cons, the good part of the United Way for Arts is that it would help the contributors because there's only one, one uh, person or one group coming around asking for money. That sounds appealing, I'm sure, to a lot of you. Um, it, it probably would benefit smaller organizations who perhaps don't have the expertise or the, the uh, development funds or whatever to go out and do a major fundraising campaign. Um, the major organizations, I don't know. It could be in, in other communities where it has been tried, apparently, the smaller organizations gain most from it. But again, it has to be a united concern. It can't be something that is uh, placed on the organizations 
they have to really want to do that. And they have to really get together. And at one time, uh, the mid-sized organizations did receive a grant from the, the Metropolitan Arts Commission to do publicity. And the way they chose to spend that was um, with the, the great art mystery, if you recall that. And I'm not sure that we even have in yet from them their final report on whether they think it did them a great deal of good. We don't know that yet. But in that case, yes, we have funded that sort of, of uh, campaign. Does that answer most of your question? Thank you. Yes. Uh, Bob Wheel, member. Uh, the arts are of tremendous value to Portland, but they're also of great value to Clackamas County and Washington County and Clark County. Does the Metropolitan Arts Commission have any plans to be truly a metropolitan agency and get funds and support from the entire region? Well, I suppose we're like any agency. We'd love to expand, you know, that <laughs> every group thinks it would be wonderful to kind of ooze out in and take in more territory. Um, Beaverton does have its own arts commission, although it's not set up quite the way that we are. Uh, they are a, an organization that is uh, sent out to get their own funds and do their own thing, but they also have to report to city council, I think, on how they spend it. Um, in fact, having attended the last uh, National Association, National Assembly of Local Arts Agencies uh, convention with Selena, I discovered that a lot of of councils are that way. A lot of commissions are that are that way. They have to get out and raise the funds themselves. Um, yeah, I, we certainly agree that, that Clackamas County and, and Washington and all the rest are really important too, but uh, probably what's going to happen is that they will have their own arts organizations, their own commissions. Some indeed do around the state. Any other questions? Alan Oliver, City Club member. You mentioned the success of the Pacific Ballet Theater in bringing international quality dancers. And uh, I suppose that there are other instances along these lines. Uh, Chamber Music Northwest might be one in bringing the widely recognized soloists to Portland. Uh, what is your opinion of uh, the state of the Portland audience? Does it take the international star coming to Portland, as in the uh, Mount Hood Jazz Festival, in order to develop an organization? Or can we really support the talent that we have here? It certainly doesn't hurt to bring in the national star. <laughs> the, uh, the national star, I think, does something for an organization. This is just off the top of my head, obviously. but. Uh, Undoubtedly, when Barishnikov came here to dance, there were a number of people who attended a ballet who had never been before. But they thought, well, they were probably dragged along by a, a wife who said, I'm going to go and come with me. You're going to see the best. And the spin-off effect of that, of course, is that what that person who didn't attend ballet before discovered is that gee, ballet isn't all this funny swan lake and tutus and whatever. It can be an exciting art form and, hey, I really liked it. So that's, that's the, the benefit, I, as I see it, from having the, the national stars come in. Of course, also, they, they certainly help the organization by raising a great deal of money for them if all works out. It helps a great deal to have one sponsor or a couple of sponsors say, we'll pick up that the cost of having that person or those people come in and, and do a show. Um, the second part of the question was, can we, what, do, do we have the audience for, for the local arts? Um, I think so. The, um, the symphony uh, does better, I believe, on nights when they have a, a special performer, but there's also a good solid core of people who just simply enjoy supporting the symphony and, and want to see good uh, music, hear good music, and, and go for that reason. The, um, the theaters are a little different matter. Um, 
Seattle, for example, has, um, I think it's, it's five or four equity theaters. And their, their budgets are in the one million to five million range. And our greatest one here is about uh, $800,000. Um, in Seattle, I was, I was in New York recently and, and saw I'm Not Rappaport, which won the Tony Award for the best play. And my understanding is that originated in Seattle. So in Seattle, they certainly do have the support for local theater, local performances. And I really don't see any reason why we can't have that in Portland. One of the problems in, in Portland is that a lot of the theater groups have not really targeted their market area, their market audience. They haven't decided who they want to reach, and they haven't marketed that particular aspect of the theaters that they, uh, the performances that they do. Uh, some of them probably need to decide, um, you know, whether they're going to be a tiny experimental theater and, and present the, the really far out stuff, and that's the market they're going to go after. Others need to decide, yes, they're going to do good old standards and, and really zero in on that market. You're, you're probably sitting right next to the lady who knows more about the, the theater here than and what, what's going on there. Yes. James Lehman, City Club member. I want you to comment on a more concerted effort. It seems we, in the City Club, we've talked a lot about economic development, and that's one of the problems. We need um, new industry in uh, this area to help support uh, the arts. But we've also talked about the need to attract new industry in this area. We have to have an appealing climate in the arts and right. in our schools, which uh, would uh, like Jefferson High School has a dance program, but we need to increase the arts and foreign language and all kinds of things in the schools. Do so you see this as a, something where we need a concerted effort, in, you know, f including many areas of our state where uh, the arts are a part of uh, the total economic development picture? Yes, and in fact, uh, maybe the arts can be one of those industries too. Who knows? But uh, when you talk about the schools, um, we really need to work on getting more arts education into the schools. Uh, for one thing, there's only, there, there are no full-time arts instructors at any elementary school in Portland. Um, that's kind of shocking. In middle school, they get to choose between PE, the students get to select a course. They have a, a, some electives, they can, they can choose PE, um, art, music, um, library. In, yeah, in high school, uh, they have, a, they have a, a, an arts requirement. They have to have one credit of, uh, before they can graduate, but that can be fulfilled by having a foreign language, which in effect most college-bound students select because a foreign language is an entrance requirement for a good many colleges now. Uh, their other choices could be home ec or uh, shop, and then the art and the music. But perhaps we're not, by not doing that, we're, we're certainly lacking the creative uh, intellect that's going to come out of that sort of training. And besides that, we're not developing audiences either. Uh, I don't know, when I was in high school, in a smaller high school than than most of the ones offered here. We had a wide variety of arts courses and music courses, and um, there was the band, there was the orchestra, and a lot of schools now don't have that. And how, how can a, a symphony expect uh, young people to be really interested in classical music if they haven't had that background so that they even know what they're listening to? Did that answer that question? Thank you. Bob. I'm Bob Shoemaker, member. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, one of the things that you really need to bring the arts to the attention of everybody is very good media coverage so that the people can read about it casually and become interested in what they see in the newspapers and on local television. I'm not particularly aware that Portland is doing an outstanding job in the media in bringing your message to all of us. I wonder if you have any comments on that or any suggestions on how that might be improved if indeed it needs improvement. Well, the Arts Commission is um, uh, going to be making a more concerted effort toward uh, speaking with the news media. 
But you're probably like me, Bob. Have you ever wondered what it would be like, what the world would really be like if they had as many arts writers and arts casters as they do sports writers and sports casters? <laughs> <laughs> We are working on it, but you need to, too. Yeah. Susan Butrell, City Club member. You mentioned in your speech the organizations across the country that have had a lot of successes, but we do know that there are several or a lot of arts organizations across the country that are also in trouble. Um, in the last few years, there have been so, quite a few cuts in federal funding for the arts. Could you tell us what that proportion is and how much effect it's had on arts organizations? Actually, the, you hear a lot about those cuts, but there really haven't been all that many cuts. It's kind of interesting. I know everybody complains about it, but um, when we were in Washington, and, and Selena hears all the time from, from the NEA, she's in close contact with them, and they really haven't cut back all that much. It's just kind of a perceived notion that that's happening. Um, I presume that the arts organizations around the country are in the same kind of trouble because uh, they don't have the local support. That is, uh, you know, the, the federal government is, is something that is supposed to leverage local support. And uh, if an organization doesn't, if a city or whatever doesn't get it, then it can't do that. But in reality, there hasn't been that much of an NEA cutback. Yes. We have time for one last quick question. Paul Simpson, member. A discouraging fact to me is that, to my knowledge, no business has found financial advantage in advertising through uh, arts subsidy. Texaco tried it with opera and has given it up, and I can name a number of other. General Motors tried it one way and another, but in all cases, they've given it up. Is that impression wrong? Has the banks of Oregon profited by sponsoring arts in their buildings, or do you have any information as to whether businesses ever find it advantageous to use art forms as an advertising medium? I don't know that we have that information. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, uh, the corporations around this area probably haven't given it a very good try because in, in our economic impact study in 1984, which is the last one that we did, we do it every couple of years, um, the average corporate gift to an arts organization was between $100 and $500 which doesn't make a terribly large impact on either the organization or on the media or in the advertising media. Uh, if we had more contributions from the corporate world here, perhaps we could tell more about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, for We are indeed at a crossroads in this area, and I thank you for bringing the, some of the facts uh, home to us in such a pointed manner. Remember our next two programs, next Wednesday and next Friday, both uh, having to do with economics uh, of our area. We are adjourned. This program was sponsored by Portland General Electric Company.